and welcome to Toka Backstage. Uh, I'm here with uh, the illustrious Robin Spielberg, who will be doing Robin Spielberg's Holiday Sing Along on November 30th at 8 p.m. at the Ar James Armstrong Theater. Um, Robin, it's so great to have you with us today. Um, I know you're uh, you're all the way in on the East Coast, uh, yeah. but uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, Robin is a Steinway artist. She has um, produced a number of amazing uh, records. Uh, she's written a book called Make It on the Bench, which I can't wait to hear more about. <laughs> and um, she has uh, performed in over 60 off-Broadway shows. And as I understand it, you're also a founding member of the Atlantic Theater Company. Yes, yes, I actually started off uh, as an actor. So I was, um, I went to NYU and I studied with David Mamet and William H. Macy and we started the Atlantic Theater Company with my classmates. Uh, and I was chasing my Broadway dreams for quite some time um, in those early years in the, in the 1980s. Uh, but I supported myself, unlike a lot of other struggling actors who were waiting tables, I, I supported myself by playing the piano. I was playing piano in hotel lobbies and uh, piano rooms all over Manhattan. And so I had my one foot in acting and one foot in music for quite some time. I, I'd written some um, music for musical theater and uh, I had written some music for scene changes for theater and then sometimes I'd be acting in a play. And so I had that going on for quite some time. But when I um, created my first record in 1993, I decided to take a one year hiatus from auditioning just to see where it would go. And, and I, I never went back. So I've been doing my one woman piano show ever since. And uh, do you ever keep in touch with all the Atlantic theater? Oh yes. People? Oh yes. No, we're very, um, Felicity Huffman's one of my, one of my closest friends and, uh, she's been a busy actor and, uh, and, and William H. Macy. We all, we're all in, in pretty good touch, especially the original founding members. Um, we just formed a bond, I think, that's going to last our lifetimes. Now, I, I I don't know if I can tell this story as well as you could, but we had you perform at the Studio Cabaret series some years back. Right. And you had come out, I think, a little earlier during that day before the show. You went to visit the set of Desperate Housewives. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you remember that. Yeah, right. that was. That's right. I um. Usually when I come out to California, I'll stay with, with Flick Up um, and, and we catch up and we went hiking. And I think that day she had no, she just was so busy um, working. And so she said, come to the set. So we just kind of hung out in the trailer and I went to the set and watched them film Desperate Housewives. It was super fun. But I, I, I seem to recall you mentioning that you, during one of her scenes, you were in the backseat of a car while she was filming. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. You know, all the things that you don't see on television. Yes. So she said, do you want to come in and see what it's really like? And I'm like, sure. So I had my head ducked down on, in the back row, the back seat of the car, while they filmed a scene in the a driver and passenger seat. So I can kind of see how the camera's all in there, like right in their faces and doing the scene. It was pretty fun. That's always kind of fun to see the, 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 yeah. what it's really like back behind. Oh, yes, yes. And they do so many takes, things over and over and over. It takes, you know, hours and hours to shoot a page. A lot of patience, a lot of patience required. And then you, um, you wrote a book, uh, Naked on the Bench, The Adventures of Pian in Piano Land. Yes, my bench. I always call this, here I am at the piano, and I always call my time at the piano when I tell my husband, uh, you know, where I'm going. I say, I'm, he's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to Piano Land, which means I'm going into my, my, my piano room, my oasis to go be in the land of piano. And um, so when I, I've always been a journal keeper um, and you know, some of the things that happen on the road, just people, it's too crazy to even make up. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the stuff that happens. So I would keep my diary or a journal of some of my, um, my road stories and every now and then I would share them as a blog or to a friend or to audiences and many people suggested you should put that those stories together in a book and uh, I said ah, you know and, and over time I thought you know that's not such a bad idea I actually have a really close friend who's also named Robin one of my my she's a wonderful pianist in Europe and she had written a few um, memoirs about her um, adventures and she really was very instrumental in encouraging me to go ahead and do the same 
people always laugh about the title. They giggle because it's called Naked on the Bench. But that has a, that has a, a double meaning. Uh, when you are an artist, you know, performing for an audience, uh, you are very vulnerable. You know, you feel pretty naked. In order to do a, I think, a meaningful um, performance that people can relate to and share, you need to really um, kind of break down that fourth wall and and connect with your audience. So you're you're vulnerable. But the title also has special meaning because my wonderful husband, who you know very well, he's also my booking agent, uh, Larry Cawson, he. Uh, he had booked me on this wonderful tour throughout Montana. Uh, it lasted about a month. And at the very end, I had a, um, a concert at a resort in Idaho that turned out to be a clothing optional resort. Ooh. So while I did not play naked, I did not. I opted to keep my clothes on. The audience um, decided to, you know, show up without their clothes on. So I had socks and, and a hat. And that was just one of the most ridiculous, funny, things I'd ever done. So I thought that would be a good title for the book. So that gives a whole new meaning to the, or the, the whole phrase when your people have like stage fright, they say, go out there and picture the audience naked. Yeah, I you tell people, that's, picture no, people. don't, don't. That's the most <laughs> terrifying thing ever. Once you've played for a naked audience, you pretty much can do anything. You can jump off high buildings and go skydiving and nothing scares you after that. I, I would think that, that uh, oof. Um, well, it's a lifestyle. That's all I could say. It was not a sexual thing at all. This was a no. family oh, sure. resort. And people just go swimming and play volleyball and sit on their little towels and watch a show. It's, it's kind of it's kind of odd. You get a you get a little used to it. And um I I know that I was very emotionally exhausted because I was very conscious to stare everyone in the eye. <laughs> yes, right. Right. <laughs> Kept eye contact at all times. So so you um you started out trying to do the the actress thing, and and yep. then the and then you went into the music thing. What, at what point did you realize, okay, it's the music thing from here on out? Well, um, you know, there's that phrase where people say, "Better be careful what you wish for," right? Uh, so, what happens when the thing that you've wished for happens, and it's not what you thought? Then what? Do you live your life kind of faking your way through or are you truthful with yourself? So here's what happened. I was, I did not get the lead in the show that I wanted, but I did get the understudy for the lead and a small part in a role. Um, again, this was at Lincoln Center and I am doing the play with people I love. All the elements came together. I had good reviews. I loved the director. I was getting paid well. Um, audiences were coming. It was full. All of those things came together. So here I am doing a show eight shows a week, and all of my friends are insanely jealous. They go, oh, my gosh, you're so lucky. It's so wonderful. And I'm there doing the show saying, well, what's so crazy about my day to day? I mean, that was the honest truth. Um, the other actors around me were very happy with their day to day. And what it looked like was, you know, getting up in the morning and going to your dance class, going to your voice class, going on an audition, going to the gym, reporting to the theater and like doing it all over again. And that whole process of constantly auditioning and competing for roles was not really fun. I liked the end result. I liked being in a play. I love the camaraderie and the process of working on a part and originating a role that was wonderful but the reality is that you need to you know have joy in your life in your every day because if you're going to be honest um if you're pursuing a life as an actor you're going to get booked or get roles a few times a year that are great if that right and is that enough to keep you happy and satisfied on the other hand you know i could not go into my apartment and act but i can go into my apartment at any time play the piano write a song and that brought me constant joy, whether I was playing piano at a hotel or at a club or by myself, that always brought me joy. So these things converged at the same time I was doing this play and at the same time got my record deal. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to, like, as I said, take that year off of yeah. audition just to see where this goes. And I, I never looked back. I just uh, had no regrets. On the other hand, if I had not pursued acting first, I'm not sure I'd even have a piano show. Right. Because the acting, um, 
training and experience uh, really helped me uh, combat stage fright and learn how to create a, kind of a theater piece within the confines of a concert setting, which is a bit unusual, as you know. Most yeah. um, piano or concert artists come out, take a bow, play, and leave <laughs> because they don't teach that in school of how to connect with your with your audiences. So I think it was all very valuable. Well, and I did. I I have noticed having presented you a couple of times in the past. You're very. Um, you have a gr you start off with a great rapport with the audience. I mean that that that's really evident in in your sort of your banter with them. And I I would think that the acting sort of helped you with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and also all of the gigs I've done. So prior to going out on the road, I played for twelve years in piano rooms and hotel lobbies. Sometimes my job was simply to be the wallpaper. I, I kid you not. It was like the quiet, as quietly as you could play while people ate and fine dining. You know, that was my job. <laughs> and so you had to really evaluate the room. And sometimes you could tell when Broadway hour was coming and people were getting ready to go to the show and you kind of knew what was hot on Broadway and what show they might be going to. Go ahead and play a few tunes from that show. So you had to really know how to feel out the audience. You quickly look at the demographic and say, oh, this audience might appreciate things from the 40s and 50s. This audience might appreciate right. the 70s. And so you learn how to pick up on those cues. And I think that's an important skill to have because I want the audience to come and have a really nice time, not to kind of sit there with their hands folded and politely applaud. We're kind of in this together to experience, have a fun evening together. So when you aren't performing or playing, what kind of music do you listen to? I listen to talk radio. Huh. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, people will laugh, but I don't even have a sound system in my house. Um, I do listen to music. This is, this is Grammy voting season, so I'm getting tons and tons of things to listen to to evaluate for my voting process. But um, I have music in my head all the time, all the time. It's a blessing and a curse. So I'm kind of listening to that. <laughs> yeah, right. So when I'm driving in the car, I kind of, I don't really want to hear, listen to music because um, then I'm kind of working. I'm kind of working in my mind what the chord changes are and the patterns and the keys. And I'm kind of thinking about it, not necessarily enjoying it. So um, I have listened to the Hamilton soundtrack probably more than anything I've listened to in the last couple of years. Crazy about it. Um, but for the most part, I, I kind of listen to some talk, talk radio. That makes sense. Yeah. So um, I guess to address the elephant in the room, knowing you what? or following you on Facebook, I, I, I know that you are of uh, the Jewish persuasion. Yes. How do you address it when people ask you about doing a holiday show? I, I mean, it's not just Hanukkah, but it's a holiday show, and you're yeah. Jewish. Yes, I am. I'm Jewish. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because my, when I signed with a small record label in the 1990s, North Star Music, they picked up my first CD, which was um, all original piano solos. And as I was going to my, I went to my car so excited. I'd signed my first record deal. I was just so happy. I was in Rhode Island and I was driving back to New York. And the record company president knocked on my window, you know, roll it down. And he said, hey, you know, we're signed here for a six record deal over three years. I just want to let you know a lot of our business, because they sold music at that time in gift stores and bookstores, not necessarily Power Records or Sam Goody. I wanted to let you know that a lot of our business is in November and December. We do um, a lot of holiday music. We always release Christmas records every year. Would you be interested in doing one? And I said, sure. I've never given it much thought. I said, I'm Jewish. And he said, great. You'll have a whole fresh take on it. <laughs> and all the way home, I was singing Christmas songs, trying to think of like, well, what would I want to record? What would I want to do? Um, and I had the best time because this music is beautiful music. We all grew up loving it and learning it. So that first record I did for them was called Spirit of the Holidays. And it was a piano, cello, guitar uh, recording of traditional Christmas songs. And it, it really, it sold like 100,000 copies. It did phenomenally well. And we went and we toured it. 
And then the next one I did, I said, I really would like to explore Christmas music from around the world, not just the ones we've heard of, like maybe a song from Greece, you know, St. Basil's hymn, you might've heard of that one. It's a really beautiful, you know, Greek Christmas hymn. So uh, they said, okay. And I recorded that. And my grandmother, who at the time was in her late 80s, said, so you recorded two Christmas CDs, the one you're going to do Hanukkah. I was like, well, Grandma, there's not a lot of Hanukkah music out there. I mean, we've got the dreidel song, right? right. But uh, now we really can't, we can't compete. <laughs> Just not a lot. In fact, there are a lot of Jewish composers that have written the, the Christmas songs, like White Christmas, Irving Berlin. And she said, well, that's not true. I can teach you um, a lot of songs that I grew up with in Eastern Europe. I thought that was pretty great. Took my tape recorder, went to see my grandmother in Brooklyn. And she sang um, these beautiful songs in Yiddish and in Hebrew. And so I did a Hanukkah recording. Um, record label would not touch it because it's a very small percentage of uh, people that might be interested. Unfortunately, it's one of the best CDs I've ever made, but um, so it didn't get a lot of publicity, but I'm very proud of it. And this is just beautiful music from Eastern Europe. And I call it American Hanukkah, song celebrating Hanukkah and peace. I even recorded the U2 song, One, which he, he was writing, I think, about Northern and Southern Ireland about becoming one. Right. But it kind of applies to the Middle East as well. So I kind of did a take on that. And then I did a third Christmas record of just solo piano. So, um, you know, music is music. I, I love music. I have behind me, I have this, I was just looking at this book of um, songs from, you know, folk songs from Ireland. It's about this thick. And before you rang me, I was looking through those folk songs um, and reading them through. There's just a wealth of music out there. So um, I don't think you need to be any particular religion to enjoy the show for sure no, I, I i don't think so and, and i i also noticed just uh looking at your at your history that you did the soul of christmas the celtic music celebration yes i was on a pbs special uh, and it still airs i believe every year um what happened was that back in the like 1997 i recorded a cd called in the arms of the wind it was all uh, it was the first time i did a whole recording of solo um, no, not solo, of complete um, original music for piano and ensemble. And I had my wish list of, of uh, you know, different session players I wanted to work with. And I was, I could not even believe that Johnny Cunningham said yes. He was a fiddler. He passed away a few years ago, but he was a fiddler from Scotland. And he had been on the Wyndham Hill label. And he's an amazing fiddle player. And I was so honored and surprised that he said yes to the recording. So he came in and um, he played fiddle on this, uh, a few tunes on that album. And when he got home, he called me and he said, I adored working with you. I loved every minute of it. I'm working on a Christmas CD. <laughs> Do you want to be on it? And I was like, of course, I read Christmas <laughs> CDs. So um, I went into the studio and I put down some piano tracks and then he called a few weeks later and he said, guess what? We're going to get a PBS special based on that Christmas CD. Do you want to be on the PBS special? I said, of course. <laughs> so this turned into a PBS special called The Soul of Christmas, a Celtic music celebration with Thomas More. So not only was I the only non-Christian on it, I was the only one who wasn't Irish. <laughs> I was like, how did I end up on this recording? But it all worked very, very well. And so well that I formed a kinship with several of the musicians. And then we went on later to make another recording together. Kathy Ryan, who's an Irish artist, I think you've presented sure. her before, and Susan McKeown. Um, and I got together and we recorded a CD called Mother, a song celebrating mothers and motherhood. And that also has a Celtic flair to it. So I don't know, maybe in a past life I was... I was Irish. Who knows? Who knows? Um, so what, what do you, uh, what would somebody going to see this show coming up in, on the 30th of November, what do you hope that they walk away with? Joy. We need some, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's tough right now in the world. 
generally. Um, so, you know, you're going to come to the show and you're going to have some joy. And I know that because I just spoke with a choir director recently uh, named Laura, and she's going to bring in a bunch of her choir students and they're going to be guests on the show. And it's going to be completely adorable. You're not going to be able to stop smiling. <laughs> awesome. uh, I've also incorporated, I don't know if you have video um, capability in your venue or not. Yes. You do. So that's great because I put together a few um, videos that kind of go in the, in the background that are really fun to watch um, while I play, when I do my solo work. And when I was growing up, when I was little, I remember watching cartoons in between the cartoons It'd be like five minutes of okay, everybody, like let's sing, and they would have to follow the bouncing ball. Do, do you remember? Oh that? yeah, of course. But we're dating ourselves, but I do remember that. And I remember sitting in my, you know, watching in front of the black and white TV, like okay, Popeye's over. Now it's time to sing. Right. And everyone did that. So um, I loved it so much. I created a few follow the bouncing ball videos. So we're going to do a bit of a sing along. You don't have to sing along. If, you're, if you want to sit in the audience like this, you, you go ahead. I challenge you. Um, but I, I think you're going to want to for a, f a few of them. Awesome. Not the whole time, just but a few times, you know. I found that people really enjoy singing along. Um, and it started quite accidentally. I was doing a, a holiday show um, that I called In the Heart of Winter. And I was playing. And then I got to, like, you know, my big rendition of Jingle Bells or something. And started like hearing people singing to themselves. So I stopped, I'm like, you guys sound good, bring it, you know? And then everyone took out their keys and we're making bell sounds with their keys and they had a good time. And I went, you know, you really should welcome this a bit more. You shouldn't feel guilty about singing to yourself. Right. You ever, you're ever in the theater and you hear someone singing along, you go like that, right? I do that to my mom all the time. Mom, shh, I'm listening to the radio, like don't sing to it. <laughs> This is, a, this is the kind of atmosphere where we should lift our voices. And Great. I think people feel a whole lot better when they do. That's, so, I'm really looking forward to it. And I, it's always a pleasure to work with you. We're running a little out of time, but before we go, can you play us a little something? Sure, you'll all know this one. <laughs> That was awesome. And I will say it's okay to play that now because my wife and I were just in Home Depot last night and they already have Christmas decorations. Up. I know. As soon as the as soon as the Halloween ones are up, that ship has sailed, baby. We're we're there. It's all, <laughs> all happening. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to seeing you on November 30th. And thank you so much for your time, Robin. Thank you. See you Take soon. Bye-bye.